Statement, the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With permission, I would like to make a statement on the hostage crisis in Algeria and the tragic events of the last three days. I'm sure the whole House will share my disgust and condemnation at this brutal and savage terrorist attack that has been unfolding in Algeria. Our thoughts and prayers this morning are with those still caught up in this incident, with their families who are waiting anxiously for news, and with those who have already lost loved ones. Mr Speaker, I have this morning chaired another meeting of the COBRA Emergency Committee and just come from speaking again to the Algerian Prime Minister. So let me take the House through what we believe has happened, the steps we are taking now, and what this means for our security and the fight against terrorism around the world. In the early hours of Wednesday morning, terrorists terrorists attacked a gas installation run by BP, the Norwegian company Statoil, and the Algerian company Sonatrek, in in Aminas, in southeastern Algeria, near the Libyan border. The terrorist group is believed to have been operating under Mokhtar Belamokhtar, a criminal terrorist and smuggler who has been operating in Mali and in the region for a number of years, and who has been affiliated with Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. Mr Speaker, in Aminas is some 18 hours by road from the capital, Algiers. It is in the middle of the Sahara Desert and one of the most remote places in the world. As a result, it takes time to get a complete picture, and the full details are still emerging. But according to the information we have from the Algerian authorities, the terrorists first attacked two buses en route to the Aminas airfield before attacking the residential compound and the gas facility at the installation. It appears to have been a large, well-coordinated and heavily armed assault, and it is probable that it had been pre-planned. Two of those travelling in the convoy to the airfield were very sadly killed, including one British national, and his family were informed on Wednesday. A number of other workers were taken hostage by the terrorists in separate locations, both at the residential compound and at the gas facility. The precise numbers involved remain unclear at this stage, but the hostages included British nationals, along with the nationals of at least seven other countries and, of course, many Algerians. As soon as we heard of the attack, we initiated the government's crisis management procedures in both London and Algeria. Our most immediate priority was to establish the identity and whereabouts of British nationals, to contact their families and to do everything possible to secure their safe return. I chaired a meeting of the government's emergency committee, COBRA. I spoke to the Algerian Prime Minister on Wednesday afternoon and then again on three further occasions. From the outset, I have been clear about our implacable opposition to terrorism and said that we will stand with the Algerians in their fight against these terrorist forces. But I have also emphasised the importance, the paramount importance, of securing the safety of the hostages. I offered UK technical and intelligence support, including from experts in hostage negotiation and rescue, to help find a successful resolution. And I urged that we and other countries affected should be consulted before any action was taken. I also spoke to the leaders of other countries which had hostages taken, including Japanese Prime Minister Abe, Norwegian Prime Minister Stoltenberg, President Hollande and President Obama. And I coordinated further offers of support for the Algerians in dealing with the situation. Mr Speaker, during the course of Thursday morning, the Algerian forces mounted an operation. Mr Speaker, we were not informed of this in advance. I was told by the Algerian Prime Minister while it was taking place. He said that the terrorists had tried to flee, that they judged there to be an immediate threat to the lives of the hostages and had felt obliged to respond. When I spoke to the Algerian Prime Minister later last night, he told me that this first operation was complete, but this is a large and complex site and they are still pursuing terrorists and possibly some of the hostages in other areas of the site. The Algerian Prime Minister has just told me this morning they are now looking at all possible routes to resolve this crisis. Mr Speaker, last night the number of British citizens at risk was less than 30. Thankfully, we now know that number has been quite significantly reduced. And I'm sure the House will understand why, during an ongoing operation, I cannot say more on this at this stage. Mr Speaker, our priority remains the safety of British nationals involved, the repatriation of those killed and the evacuation of the wounded and freed hostages. A rapid deployment consular team is en route to Algiers together with other specialists and the Algerian Prime Minister has agreed my request to grant access to our consular staff to fly south as soon as possible to support those involved. I've also spoken with Bob Dudley at BP both last night and again this morning. 
We are liaising closely on BP's evacuation plans and have put additional civilian aircraft on standby to assist them with their well thought through evacuation plans if needed. Mr Speaker, we need to be absolutely clear whose fault this is. It is the terrorists who are responsible for this attack for the loss of life. The action of these extremists can never be justified. We will be resolute in our determination to fight terrorism and to stand with the Algerian government, who have paid a heavy price over many years fighting against a savage terrorist campaign. This is a continuing situation, and we will do our best to keep Parliament and the public updated. We hope this will reach a conclusion shortly. There will then, of course, be a moment to learn the necessary lessons. And I commend this statement to the House. Yes. Ed Miliband. Mr Speaker, can I start by thanking the Prime Minister for his statement and let me say to him on behalf of the opposition that the Government has our full support as it responds to these appalling and tragic events and I want to thank him for keeping me informed over the course of the last 24 hours or so. Can I start by echoing his words in offering our deepest concern and sympathy to the families and loved ones affected by this shocking act of terror? The thoughts of the House and the country will be with the family of the British citizen that has died and all those families enduring the uncertainty of waiting for news of their loved ones. Mr Speaker, alongside Algerians and other foreign nationals, those involved are British citizens seeking to earn an honest living far from home and their families. It is appalling that innocent, decent people have been targeted in this way. There is no, nor can there ever be, any justification for the taking of hostages. And those who planned and are responsible for this attack must be in no doubt that Britain, along with the international community, stands united in condemnation. It is the hostage takers, as the Prime Minister said, who bear the responsibility for these events. (coughs) And we must do everything in our power to bring them to justice. Mr Speaker, I appreciate that the operation on the ground is ongoing, so the Prime Minister is obviously restricted in the information he can reveal. Bearing this in mind, I'd like to ask him some some questions. First, the families of those affected will need support and care at this difficult time. So can he assure the House that all necessary support will be provided, either directly here or through our consular services in the region, to the families of those affected? Second, there are a number of other such foreign-owned installations of this kind in Algeria and the wider region. Can the the, the Prime Minister provide some information to the House about how the government is working with British companies to review the security situation at these facilities? Third, given that this incident happened in an isolated part of southern Algeria, what is the government's advice for UK nationals working, living or travelling in Algeria or the wider region? Fourth, at this early stage, what information is the Prime Minister able to share about the motives of the terrorist cell responsible for this attack? And more broadly, can he set out what is the government's assessment of the level of threat posed by groups connected to al-Qaeda in the Maghreb (coughs) operating in the region? And had there been any indication of an increased threat from these groups? Fifth, does he agree with me that this attack, alongside the events in Mali, are the latest indication of a still growing security threat in North Africa and the wider region? And does he recognise that this demands intensified international collaboration, intelligence sharing and diplomatic activity focused on this part of the world? (coughs) Mr Speaker, for now, all efforts must be centred on resolving this ongoing crisis and ensuring the safety of British citizens. For the families concerned, this is a dark and difficult time. The whole House stands united in support of them, and the thoughts of the whole country are with them. Prime Minister. Well, first of all, can I thank the right hon. Gentleman for his support and for his words. He's absolutely right. There is no justification for this hostage-taking, and we will continue to do everything we can to hunt the people down who are responsible for this and for other such terrorist um, outrages. Taking his questions in turn, first of all, in terms of support for the families... Um, It is absolutely vital. They get all the support possible. Police liaison officers are attached to each of the families and can keep them updated with any additional and new information. BP are obviously doing everything they can um, to support as well. BP have made a statement uh, this morning, uh, which is important because it sets out what they've done to repatriate uh, BP staff from Algeria. And three flights left Algeria yesterday, carrying a total of 11 BP employees, 
we are providing a backup service to make sure that if there are any gaps in what BP are able to do, we can uh, fill those gaps. His second question about the security of other installations is absolutely vital. We are urgently coordinating with British and Western oil companies in the region about their security in the light of this incident. All installations in Algeria are on a state of high alert and additional security measures will be put in place where necessary. We have also taken precautions to ensure the security of diplomatic posts in the region uh, and given them uh, advice. He mentions travel advice. This is an important issue. Uh, We continue to advise against all but essential travel advice to Algeria. We also advise against all but essential travel to areas within 450 kilometres of the Mali and Niger borders and within 100 kilometres of the Mauritanian uh, border. Uh, And the travel advice has been updated to read specifically, a serious terrorist attack has taken place near the town of In Aminas, near the Algerian border with Libya. Uh, The Algerian security forces have subsequently conducted operations in the area. It remains a very dangerous, uncertain and fluid situation. In terms of the motives and the precise identity of the terrorists, it is always difficult uh, to determine that at this um, early stage. But what we know is the terrorist threat in the Sahel comes from Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, AQM. They aspire to establish Islamic law across the Sahel and northern Africa. And they also aspire to attack uh, Western interests in the region and, frankly, wherever they can. Um, He asks quite rightly about... Uh, the growth of the threat from this part of the world, it is growing. It is a focus, quite rightly, uh, for us and for other countries. The truth is, just as we have reduced uh, the scale of the al-Qaeda threat uh, in other parts of the world, including in um, Pakistan and Afghanistan, so the threat has grown in other parts of the world, and we need to be equally um, concerned about that and equally focused on that. So um, I hope that answers uh, his questions. I think there is a great need, not just for Britain, but for other countries, to give a real priority to understanding better and working better with the countries in this region. Uh, This government has held a National Security Council meeting quite recently on this area. I appointed the Right Honourable Member for Eddisbury uh, to be a special envoy to this region, which obviously is a region with very, very great uh, Um, French influence uh, and uh, contacts to France, but where we believe it's very important in our own national interest to thicken and improve our contacts with these countries, and that is what we must do as part of the lessons learned from this exercise. I'm grateful for his questions and the way he puts them. It's difficult to answer further questions on, uh, particularly on numbers, but I will try and keep the House and the country updated. Order. Sir Malcolm Rifkind. The Prime Minister will recall Churchill's remark that North Africa is the soft underbelly of Europe. Uh, Does uh, my right honourable friend agree that that is true today and that al-Qaeda, either inspired or directed terrorism, is as much of a threat to the people of this country and of Europe as it is to the unfortunate people who live in that region? Given that the United Kingdom traditionally has not had a strong presence in that part of North Africa, will will the Prime Minister agree that there is now a very powerful case for a much stronger political, diplomatic and intelligence effort in that region as part of a coordinated strategy uh, with our European and American allies and with the wider international community. My my right honourable friend is right in both the regards. I think those who believe somehow that there is a terrorist, extremist, al-Qaeda problem uh, in parts of North Africa and it's a problem for them and we can somehow back off and ignore it, I think that is profoundly wrong. This is a problem for them. It is also a problem for us. And I think we need to be absolutely clear about that, particularly in our support of the French action in Mali, where it's vital we do not allow... Uh, an al-Qaeda-sponsored regime to take over the entirety of that country. I also think he's right that we need in our strategic uh, thinking and our strategic defence reviews uh, to make sure we give proper priority to this um, area of the world. This government is now doing that, but I'm sure there's more work we need to do. Mr Geoffrey Robinson. Grateful, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank the Prime Minister indeed for coming, and very appropriate that he reported as he did in the tone that he adopted in this very grave situation. 
He rightly says we must give the French every support. Can you just give, and I, I think the whole House would agree with that, it's important they prevail, their intervention there, which enjoys the support of the whole Security Council and of the UN, does prevail. Uh, can you just confirm we have responded positively to every request for French, from the French for our logistical uh, help or other help where we've been able to, pro to provide it? I'm happy to give the right honourable gentleman that assurance. I think we were the first country anywhere in the world to get on to the French and to say, how, ask how we could help, and then to deliver help in the form of two C-17s, uh, one of which has actually been transporting uh, French troops into uh, Mali. I spoke again with President Hollande yesterday uh, and said that offer of the continued use of that C-17 was there, and we're also look looking at a range of other things that we can do uh, to help in terms of logistics and backup. Uh, as I've said, we fully support the French action. The threat in Mali of a, effectively a, a rebel regime supported by terrorists, supported by Al-Qaeda taking over that country is not just a threat to that region, it is a threat to the world. Of course we should also be helping and are helping with um, encouraging other countries in West Africa to bring troops into Mali to help uh, defend the Malian government, the Malian people. And there are good signs that uh, countries in West Africa are taking uh, that that lead and, and uh, helping to achieve that effect. But we should continue to work very closely with the French, and I will do so in order to see how further we can help. Mr Martin Horwood. The uh, EU military training mission in Somalia has achieved great success, and there is uh, now similar plans to support the Malian armed forces with an EU training mission. Do these terrible events actually demonstrate a wider need uh, for training and support for authorities across the region, both to increase resilience to attack but also to improve the chances of successful outcomes that minimise loss of life when terrible events like this do happen. Well, I think my honourable friend is entirely right. They do, these events demonstrate the importance of training missions. They also demonstrate the importance of having uh, good and strong politi political, diplomatic and military relations uh, with countries in the region. I would also say the example in Somalia shows the importance of encouraging uh, neighbouring countries to, to play a role in helping to provide security and helping to, provide, um, to, to rebuild those countries. Clearly, as I've said, in Mali we support the action the French government has taken, but I think over time it is very important that it's the countries of West Africa that step up to help provide stability and beat back terrorism in this country. Mr Angus Robertson. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I thank the Prime Minister for his statement. This tragedy is touching families in a great many countries and it's causing fears for families in many places, including Scotland. Can the Prime Minister give an assurance that there's the greatest possible coordination with the Scottish Government to make sure that families receive all necessary support? I, I can certainly give the Honourable Gentleman that uh, assurance. Uh, the Foreign Office uh, Minister... Um, the hon Honourable Member for um, uh, North East Bedfordshire has spoken on several occasions to Kenny McCaskill. I myself spoke to the first, Scottish First Minister uh, yesterday. Um, I think it's very important we work together very closely on this and we'll try and keep you updated on all the information. Sir Tony Baldry. There's some uh, terrorist atrocities. There was obviously some time uh, in the planning they needed to acquire weapons, quartermasters, all that kind of stuff. And doesn't it um, emphasise the need for us to work collaboratively uh, with our friends in Europe and the United States and us to share intelligence to try and ensure that groups like this have the greatest possible difficulty in um, accessing weaponry and also that so far as is possible they are denied access to the international banking system. It's fine the international community quite rightly imposing sanctions on countries such as Iran but we also need to ensure that we frustrate and do everything through the intelligence services to frustrate non-state actors such as this from being able to perpetrate acts of hostility against us and others. I, I think my rightful friend makes a very important point. We have to do everything we can with our partners uh, in terms of security and intelligence cooperation to provide as little space as possible for these terrorist organisations, whether that is in the banking system or, frankly, whether it is in the availability of safe havens. And that is what is so concerning about what's happened in uh, West Africa, where you know, Mali has become a, a safe haven for parts of Mali become a safe haven for these terrorists. So he's absolutely right in what he says. Mr Keith Vaz. Speaking further to the question from the Right Honourable Member for Banbury, the fight against international terrorism cannot be conducted by one country alone. It has to be coordinated. <coughs> Given that Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb also operates in Morocco 
and in Tunisia. What assistance can we give to those countries by way of sharing information or perhaps giving them counter-terrorism assistance so that we can contain this issue rather than let it spread to other countries in North Africa? I think the uh, right honourable gentleman makes a a very important point. Obviously, we have good relations with countries like Tunisia and Morocco, good relations at a political and diplomatic uh, level. There are obviously opportunities for intelligence sharing, uh, but I would also argue that we need to add to that um, a degree of military-to-military talks and cooperation so that when these regrettable uh, events take place, there's a a, a (coughs) high level of trust and ability to work together. Um, Obviously, there are some countries in the region where we have very long historical relations, for instance, with Nigeria, and so it's a very thick relationship politically, diplomatically, militarily, counter-terrorism and all the rest of it. I think we need to go through all our contacts and work out how best to strengthen them in each case. Mr Bernard Jenkin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I commend my right honourable friend's statement? And is this not a sharp reminder that we live in a world of ungoverned spaces and terrorist groups that can strike and create violence at any time? And is that not therefore very important that we maintain Whitehall and our agencies on a wartime footing, ready to respond as he is now? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for what he said. I think it's a reminder of two very clear points. One is we do face a large and existential terrorist threat from a group of extremists based in different parts around the world who want to do the biggest possible amount of damage to our interests and to our way of life. I think that is the first thing. And the second thing is that they thrive when they have ungoverned spaces in which they can exist and build and can plan. So I very much agree with what he says. Uh, under, the, uh, under this government, as under previous governments, a lot of priority has been given in terms of funding to the security services and I think there is now a good system for bringing together intelligence, military and political planning through the National Security Council and in other ways including through the COBRA framework, the Emergency Committee framework which brings people together very rapidly to make sure that all the parts of uh, the British government and state are able to, to, to bring their expertise to bear. This is Helen Goodman. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, the, uh, this is an area which is extremely <coughs> unstable. Algeria, as the Prime Minister knows, has just emerged from a civil war. There are failed states on either side. Could the Prime Minister say a little more about the diplomatic activity which uh, he is now going to embark upon with this region? Yes. Well, first of all, I would want to praise uh, our ambassador to to Algeria and his staff have been working around the clock and have been extremely effective in getting uh, information to us about what is happening. Uh, To answer the Honourable Lady's question, we're expanding our network of embassies uh, and contacts around the world, Uh, but all the time we have to look at how well we are uh, represented in different countries and where best to thicken the contacts that we have. I think we have to do this in partnership with other countries. You know, there's no doubt that, uh, for instance, in parts of West Africa, the French have uh, excellent connections in countries where we have less good connections, but likewise there are countries where the opposite applies. I think we need to work with our partners on this. I discussed this with President Obama uh, last night and make sure that between us we have the strongest possible contacts. Bob Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank my right honourable friend for a statement telling us as much as he can about what has happened? But may I ask my right honourable friend whether our specialist experts in kidnap and ransom and hostage negotiation are still on standby to help in the case of this operation ongoing, as it seems to be, for perhaps a small group of terrorists who are holding nationals from this country and other allies? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman, my Honourable Friend, for his question. The answer to his question is yes, they are on standby, uh, hostage negotiating experts and other sorts of technical expertise that we can provide. I've made all of those offers to the Algerian uh, Prime Minister, uh, so all those offers stand. We do have considerable uh, expertise, but let me make one point clear, because you, you have to remember when you are the, the government, in the case of the Algerian government, facing this challenge of a massive terrorist attack 
of lives immediately at risk. While, of course, in this country we can be hugely proud of the technical expertise and the brilliance of our uh, security forces and our special forces, you know, you can have the ultimate degree of planning and still find that these events can end unhappily. And so we should bear that in mind when thinking about the action that the Algerians have taken. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. I think the Prime Minister's statement, and obviously the situation facing those in this gas plant is appalling. What consideration is he giving to uh, greater British military involvement anywhere in the region, including Mali, and what the possible consequences of this will be for uh, the future of that whole region and the possibilities of a long-term political peace in the area? Well, first of all, what I'd say to the Honourable Gentleman is that we have offered um, logistic and other assistance to the French along the lines that I've set out, C-17 planes, other logistical support. We're also looking at the issue of the uh, EU training mission and how we could contribute to that. Uh, I don't believe in in Mali we're talking remotely about uh, combat troops or or, uh, that sort of approach. That is is not the role we see for ourselves in um, in that conflict. But I would just say again, I think we should strongly support what the French and what the West African countries are trying to do in Mali, which is to push back uh, the rebel forces who are backed by al-Qaeda to make sure they cannot take control of that country. And I would very much caution against uh, anyone who believes that if somehow we stayed out of these issues and just said this has got nothing to do with us, that would somehow make us safer. I don't believe uh, that is the case. The uh, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, AQM, is out to harm, kill, maim, do the worst it can against Western interests, including uh, British interests, uh, and I think we have to bear that in mind. That is a terrorist threat that we face that is made worse when we have so much ungoverned space in Mali at the same time. Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. I thank my right honourable friend for this statement to the House this morning. Algeria is one of the biggest and most powerful countries in the region. Uh, would he undertake to maintain the closest possible uh, diplomatic links with them? After all, our relations with them have improved considerably in recent years, not only to combat the uh, immediate short term humanitarian needs, but also to combat the emerging <coughs> jihadist uh, threats in the Sahel and Maghreb regions. I think my honourable friend is entirely right. Relations between Britain and Algeria are good, contact is good, but I think there's always a case for for doing more. Uh, I think uh, we've had very good contact over these last few days. I mean, I won't hide that, of course, we were disappointed not to be informed of of the assault um, in advance. Um, and we do want to help in any way we can with technical uh, and other assistance. But I think we should show understanding that the Algerian government faces a huge threat from Islamist terrorists, uh, um, and they were facing a situation where there was imminent threat to life, and we should bear that in mind with the comments that we make. Mr Mike Gapes. Mr Speaker, can I uh, thank the Prime Minister for his statement? And... Uh, ask him to uh, reiterate the importance of the economic relationships between Algeria and this country. Very many homes in this cold winter are heated by gas that comes from Algeria, not just in this country but also in other parts of Europe. And surely the key message here is we will not allow the terrorist organisations to break that economic relationship, undermine that economic relationship, which is not just in Algeria's interest but also in our interest. I think the Honourable Gentleman puts the point extremely well. One of the most important things about our country is what an open, trading, investing country we are, and we have people who who, who are British citizens who live and work all over the world. And as I thought the Leader of the Opposition put it particularly well, they are working hard to do the right things, and we should support them in that. And we have to recognise that as a result, that puts a particular emphasis on the importance of our foreign and diplomatic um, policy and also the military cooperation we have, have with other countries, because part of the role of, of government is to try and help to keep our citizens safe uh, wherever they are. And I think in that, those terms, he's absolutely right about the economic relationship between us and Algeria. We have many companies with huge huge expertise in uh, exploration of oil and gas. They're a major part of the British economy. We should be supportive of them. And, and the work they do in Algeria is vital for Algeria. It's also vital for us. Mr John Barron. It is essential that we conduct an urgent review regarding the security of our people working in the region, liaising not just with the appropriate companies, but local governments as well. But given that this 
the possible links between this tragedy and the situation in Mali, a situation that's been deteriorating for some time, was a threat assessment undertaken um, regarding our interests in the region? And if so, what action followed from that? Well, the answer I'd give my honourable friend is that we are constantly updating the threat that we face from operating in any country anywhere in the region. We've known for some time with the growth of al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb that the threat has been growing. But I would very much caution against any sense that uh, and I'm not sure my old friend is saying this, that you know, if, if somehow if we didn't involve ourselves by helping the French in Mali, we would somehow make ourselves safer. Britain is a country that is open to the world, that is part of international partnerships. We should be working with others to help make the world safe all over the place, Mali included, because if we don't, the threat there will grow, and actually we will face it as well. Yeah. Gemma Doyle. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister referred to um, an offer of assistance from the con consulate. Has, can he advise um, whether or not they have yet been involved? The, the consulate is involved. We have staff deployed in Algiers who want to also travel uh, further south to be closer to uh, the events that have taken place and to help uh, in all the ways necessary with people caught up in this crisis. And we're working very closely with BP, who will also be doing the same thing, and with Statoil. So I spoke to the Norwegian Prime Minister last night as they will be uh, sending an aeroplane down there to help retrieve people as well. Mr Simon Hughes. Uh, Mr Speaker, may I thank the Prime Minister for his statement and associate my colleagues with his condolences and solidarity, and also many of my constituents who originate from North Africa, including Algeria, and who are very hard-working members of our communities here. Uh, can I ask him if he will uh, look again with our NATO allies at how we might build in the uh, direction he set uh, on the Mediterranean dialogue which exists for linking our countries with North Africa and also that the Foreign and Commonwealth Office will hold themselves available both to inform our people around the world but also people resident in the UK, for example from Algeria, who may be more worried than everybody else about what's happening to their country. Well, well, first of all, he's absolutely right. We should keep the travel advice uh, and information updated, uh, and we do. Um, in terms of what he says about Algerians living and working in this country, he's absolutely right. They make an important contribution. The general point, though, he makes about working with NATO partners to see how we can further improve links and relationships with countries, Libya, Algeria, Mali, other countries in the region. I think this is, should be a real focus in the months ahead. As I said, it's about diplomatic and political engagement, but I think also uh, military-to-military cooperation and understanding can, can, can play a real benefit as well. Jim Fitzpatrick. Speaker, I spent some time earlier this week as part of the police parliamentary scheme with CO15, the counter-terrorist unit at uh, Scotland Yard. Can the Prime Minister reassure us that the Government will continue direct funding from the Home Office and the Foreign Office for the excellent work that those officers do protecting us at home and abroad against terrorists? And can he also assure us that the Government will continue its efforts, particularly given Ben McIntyre's excellent article in The Times today, to close down the space for those who would use religion as an excuse for intolerance, whether here or abroad, or at best or at worst, violence. Well, I haven't read Ben McIntyre's column, but I will try and do so uh, later today. In terms of policing, we see the ter anti-terrorist policing and the work they do uh, as absolutely vital, uh, and this uh, we will continue to prioritise. Penny Mordaunt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for getting his priorities absolutely right? Yeah. And um, it, this is clearly a fast-moving and complex situation. <coughs> Can he reassure the House that families who have a loved one caught up in this situation will be able to access information about the general situation, what information is available, as opposed to having to wait until there is specific news about their loved one? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful for what she says. In terms of the families, and our thoughts should be absolutely with them, they would have had a truly uh, dreadful uh, few days as they think about their loved ones. I'd reiterate what I said about all of them have police liaison teams attached to them and should be able to get the latest information. I completely understand that there is always a balance to be struck as a government about making any comment 
uh, about these events as they continue and the dangers of doing so. But on the other hand, there is the danger as there is so much other information around from other countries, other governments, that I think it is important to try to give a consistent and clear message about what is happening, about the government's priorities and what we're doing to help in this very difficult situation. Thomas Doherty. Okay. The Chief of the Defence Staff shortly before Christmas proposed that one of the new infantry brigades be formally assigned to do partnership work with the Gulf and Jordanian armies. Will the Prime Minister consider extending that formalised arrangement under Force 2020 to North Africa? Yes, I think the Honourable Gentleman makes an excellent suggestion and the Chief of the Defence Staff I know has been looking at uh, whether there's more we can do in terms of uh, military exercises, military operation, military cooperation with the countries of West Africa. Uh, clearly in the Mali situation it's absolutely key that uh, Ghanaians and Nigerians and Nigerians uh, and others bring forward um, troops to help in that country and we should be thinking what can we do to help assist in that process. And I think this is the strength of having uh, regular strategic defence and security reviews to ask where the threats are coming from, where we can make the greatest difference uh, with the very talented and professional armed forces we have, and that's exactly the sort of question we should be asking. Adam Afria. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. May I commend the um, Prime Minister's decisiveness, swift, swift action and leadership in a difficult situation. Yeah. Clearly we must um, defend our British citizens abroad, and I very much welcome the support given to the Algerian, French and Malian governments. Um, could he just perhaps say a few words about the continuing role he sees for the United Nations and our role in the Security Council with regard to this situation? Well, I think my honourable friend makes an important point about the role of the United Nations and, and perhaps it enables me to answer better the honourable member for Islington's question about the importance of political processes in all of this. I profoundly believe in, for instance, in Mali, there is a military part of what needs to happen, which is beating back uh, the terrorist-sponsored uh, Al-Qaeda-backed rebels. Uh, but clearly, um, in all situations like this, there needs to be uh, political processes as well to recognise the deep political problems that many of these, these countries have. And so our role on the United Nations as a member of the Security Council, permanent member, I think we can play an important important part in coordination with our allies to help get these political processes right. But I would caution against people who think that you can find a purely political and diplomatic answer to the Malay, Malian uh, crisis. There is also a problem, a clear and present danger of a terrorist-backed regime trying to take over the whole of that country. Nick Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the uh, Prime Minister please tell us more about the government's assessment of the links between the terrorist groups in Algeria? with Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram? Well, I think the best way to, to answer that question is that, that all of these organisations that are linked to Al-Qaeda are therefore uh, linked to each other. Uh, some of them have a tighter relationship with the senior leadership of Al-Qaeda and some slightly looser, but all of the groups he mentions, whether it is Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, whether it is Boko Haram in Nigeria, uh, or any of the other organisations, they are all pursuing similar goals of violent extremism and also wanting to damage as harmfully as possible uh, the interests of countries like Britain. Andrea Ledsom. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Is my right honourable friend able to reassure the House that not only European governments, but also all North African governments, are united in their condemnation of this terrorist action? I believe that I am. I think that uh, the reaction uh, from all governments across Europe, um, North Africa and in the wider world have been completely condemnatory of this uh, terrorist attack. And I think it's very important that we speak with a united voice in saying that this sort of terrorism is never justified and frankly it has to be defeated um, and you cannot do all of that through some political process. There's a very important security and robust security response that's required. Tom Greatrix. Speaker, the Prime Minister has referred a couple of times to the fact that the oil and gas industry is an international industry and there are a considerable amount of mobility of labour from uh, British nationals working abroad and the liaison with British-based companies. But could he say a little bit more about the assessment that's been made of a number of British nationals working in this industry, not necessarily for British-based companies or, or even Western companies, who are working either as directly or as subcontractors uh, in that region, and what advice and guidance will be supplied to them? 
Well, well, first of all, uh, as I said in my statement, we are working with all of the oil companies to talk to them about the importance of greater security, and obviously all of the countries in which they operate will want to provide greater security for the Algerians, for instance, where you know, a large percentage of their economy is provided by oil and gas. It's in their interest as well as our interest that these companies are able to operate properly in their countries. I think there is my experience al already from this um, uh, episode is I think there is perhaps more we need to do to make sure the companies have a really good and up-to-date record of all the people not only who work for them but who work for any subcontractors so that when anything does go wrong we have the swiftest possible information about who is involved and who is safe and on this occasion there were some issues and difficulties around that. Jake Berry. Speaker, I thank the Prime Minister for his statement to the House this morning. In his statement, he referred to an agreement he'd been able to obtain from the Algerian Prime Minister for our diplomatic mission to go south as soon as possible. He also referred to the remoteness of this region. Could he let us know when that is due to happen and whether that will improve the flow of information back to families? Um, well, I thank the Honourable Friend for his question. We hope that the ability of our Ambassador and others in the di diplomatic team to travel further south, that will happen today, uh, and the Ambassador has a plane on standby to do exactly that. Um, in terms of getting more information about what has happened, I think that will help, but clearly we're still dealing with a very fluid and dangerous situation when a part, where a part of the terrorist threat has been eliminated in one part of the site, um, but there still remains a threat in another part of the site, and until that is completely sorted out, we're not going to get the perfect information that we require uh, about uh, the exact number of hostages and uh, the, the, the difficult facts about um, who is safe and who is not. I'd hope we'd get, be able to say more later today, but we, we simply can't at the moment and we'll have to wait for, for the outcome before we know that. Frank Dobson. Yeah, can I join with others in thanking the Prime Minister for his statement and his clear understanding of the dilemmas faced by the Algerian government? But uh, could he tell us whether, in view of the recent rise in tension in the area, any of the oil companies operating in Algeria sought extra security measures from either the Algerian government or their home government? I can't give the right honourable gentleman that assurance today. Uh, um, obviously, like the government, which makes, uh, you know, has an ongoing assessment of risk based on intelligence that comes uh, through and is properly analysed uh, by uh, the Joint uh, Terrorism Assessment Centre, JTAC, uh, com companies as large as BP also spend a serious amount of time thinking about security and risk. But he asks a good question, and I will certainly look into it for him. Mr Henry Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I commend my right honourable friend for his statement. And whilst this terrorist attack uh, is uh, likely to have been domestically planned in Algeria, Given the proximity to the Libyan border, what evidence is there of wider involvement from, other, from factions in other states? <coughs> well, I thank my honourable friend for his question. I don't think we can be certain about where this was planned. We know that there are real connections between uh, Islamist extremist militants in Algeria and those in Libya, and also we know there are very real uh, connections between those in Algeria and those in Mali. The fact is these are all part of terrorist networks and they use what available um, ungoverned space there is in order to, as I've said, plan, build and thrive. So if we look across this region, quite clearly what we need to do is to back the French and the West African countries that want to improve the security situation in Mali. We need to work with the new Libyan government to reduce the quantity of ungoverned space and make sure there's proper security in that country and that weapons are properly accounted for. And obviously we need to thicken our contacts and work well with the Algerians to help them in the long-running battle against terror. Do all of those things and probably more besides and we will have helped to make this part of the world uh, safer and more secure which would be good for itself but would also be good for us too. Sir Robert Smith. Thank you Mr Speaker. Oil and gas companies may seem big and remote but the people that work for them are part of a close-knit global family and many of my constituents commute to places like Algeria whilst their families stay at home. Does the Prime Minister recognise the extra stress that's put on them when, when there is a shortage of information and people start to speculate about the worst-case possible scenarios 
And would it be better, for, if at all possible, that speculation is kept to a minimum whilst the information is sought so that the accurate and coherent information is given to the families? I think my honourable friend is absolutely right in what he says. Um, many people in our country work in far-flung places uh, to provide for themselves and their families, and we need to support them and think of them as they do that. I think he's absolutely right as well to say we have to be very careful uh, not to give out uh, information that in any way uh, would be unhelpful. We have to remember that the terrorists watch CNN as well, as someone put it yesterday. Uh, I also respect the fact that we need to be extremely careful in what we say because of the families sitting at home uh, worrying desperately about their loved ones. Uh, uh, the difficult balance which the government will always try and get right is because there's so much information being provided in the global news environment in so many different ways, I think there's, a, there's just as there is a danger of saying something, so there is also of course a danger in saying nothing and I think we have to try and balance this very carefully as we've tried to do in recent days. Stephen Phillips. Very much, Mr Speaker. Can I also thank my right honourable friend for his statement? Uh, he's indicated to the House that there is additional consular support on the way. Uh, those in the region may be aware of this statement today. Can he say, tell the House how that additional consular support can be accessed by those in the region? And can he also tell the House how those at home who don't have uh, police, liaison, police liaison teams uh, attached to them but who may be concerned about those in the region can access information <coughs> from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office? Um, first of all, let me be clear that all of the families caught up in this tragedy do have access to police uh, liaison teams, and I think that is extremely important. For anyone else concerned about uh, loved ones in the region or people who are in the region who want advice, the best place to get that is from uh, British embassies, British consulates, uh, and also to use the, the Foreign Office website as well, where all the travel advice I is properly contained. I, I should be clear in terms of the travel advice um, to Algeria. Uh, the, the areas of Algeria where it's advised absolutely only essential travel are the dangerous border areas that it should be made clear. Mr Chris Hopkins. Speaker, and can I thank the Prime Minister for his statement. Um, following the apparent reluctance of Algeria to uh, receive assistance, is the time approaching that an international force was developed to be able to respond to such terrorist attacks perhaps under the auspices of the United Nations, so giving countries like Algeria confidence about our intentions. I think my honourable friend makes uh, an important point, but I think there are difficulties with this. In the end, we have to respect the fact um, that different countries have territorial integrity, have to make decisions that they think are in the interests of their own people, their own countries. Um, I think what we should be doing is trying to make sure that in every case there's the best possible contact and relationship between uh, countries like ours where, regrettably, for reasons of history, we've had to have a real expertise in hostage rescue and negotiation and other countries. Now, obviously, we won't have the resources to have that relationship with every country, but we should be working with allies like the French and like with the Americans and thinking where best can we add uh, value in those sorts of relationships. Obviously, in a country, as I said, like Nigeria, we have a very strong relationship on that front, and I think uh, it's an opportunity perhaps with the G8 and at other uh, international gatherings, including NATO, to work out how we can all do more so that when these uh, dreadful crises occur, access to the best available technology, surveillance, advice, help, and everything is, is more easily um, more easily delivered. Mark Reckless. I congratulate the Prime Minister on his calm and assured response through the crisis. In coordinating our response, how many of the COBRA meetings held has he had to uh, chair personally? The, the way that COBRA works is it brings together officials from across government, uh, the Ministry of Defence, our armed forces, the police and of course the security services and it can meet on an almost rolling basis in terms of bringing the latest information and intelligence to bear. Um, that, that, so it, it meets under official guise very regularly. I've chaired three COBRA meetings so far during this crisis and there will be another one later today to bring together the latest intelligence and, and I information and I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank those in the British government who have been working around the clock to try and get the latest information so that the right decisions can be made. Harriet Baldwin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, to what extent does the intelligence confirm the supposition that the planning for this appalling atrocity must have long predated uh, the French incursion into Mali last week? 
Well, I think my honourable friend asks an important question. It's very difficult to give a certain answer, but I think what can be said is because of the scale of the terrorist attack on this um, gas installation in Algeria, because of the numbers of people involved, the sophistication of, of the weapons that they had, it looks likely it was some time in the planning. But uh, as I've said, I think it would be uh, very ill thought through to say that even if it was the case there's a connection with Mali, to say somehow we are wrong to help roll back terrorist advances in Mali because it might threaten us elsewhere. I think that is entirely wrong-headed thinking. We should be in favour of rolling back terrorist uh, advances in Mali because it will help make us safer elsewhere as we squeeze the ungoverned space and recognise that these terrorists should have no place to hide. Mr Philip Hollobone. I commend the Prime Minister for his level-headed, energetic and resolute response to these developments. The West is not going to solve the problem of Islamic insurgency in the Sahara on its own. Given the colonial heritage of the African continent and the fact that this insurgency is taking place across borders, is there a role for both the British Commonwealth and the French Commonwealth within the African Union to ensure that ultimately there's an African solution to this problem? Well, I'm I'm very grateful to my honourable friend's um, remarks. I think he makes an important point about how particularly France and Britain uh, should work together. Uh, Obviously, it is better to find um, African solutions, whether it is in Somalia, where African neighbouring countries have played an important role, or in Mali, where we hope West African countries will play a role. But clearly, countries like Britain and France, with good relations, good contacts, good uh, knowledge of, of African countries, good partnerships with them, we should be working together. And I think there are opportunities Uh, to put aside some of the traditional divisions between Anglophone and Francophone Africa, to recognise it's in our interest to boost the capacity of all African states to help deal with these problems, and we should work very, very closely with the French as we do this. Mr Philip Davis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Further to the question from my honourable friend for Keithley, there may be some concern that the Algerian government didn't take up the offer from my uh, right honourable friend for the use of British special forces. Does he know why that offer wasn't taken up, and what assessment has been made by the government of the uh, expertise and capability of the Algerian forces to uh, secure the maximum number of hostages release, uh, given that there are so many British uh, citizens uh, in danger? Um, Well, well, first of all, let let me be clear. Um, Of course, we made the offer to the Algerians to help and assist in any way we could. There are obviously limitations as to what we're able to do, given the logistics and the amount of time it takes to put teams together and get people um, uh, to other sides of of the world. Um, In terms of uh, the Algerians themselves, I think we should show some respect and understanding of the fact that this country has fought a long civil war against the most aggressive and violent form of militant uh, Islam. Uh, I think we also should uh, recognise that, yes, of course, we do have uh, expertise, we do pride ourselves on the brilliance of our um, special forces, but clearly the Algerians felt they had to make decisions very quickly, they felt there was an urgent um, threat to life, um, and so they decided to act as they, they, they did. As I've said, I regret the fact that we weren't informed in advance, and of course the offers to help were there and are still there, but we do have to understand it was the danger they faced and they felt they had to act. Mr David Nuttall. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Prime Minister for his statement this morning and indeed for his calm, assured and dignified leadership at this very difficult time. I know the whole country uh, will agree that he's made exactly the right call by being here Uh, this morning. It is too early to know whether any families in my constituency have directly been affected but I know that uh, all their thoughts and prayers will be uh, with with those families who have been directly affected. Can the Prime Minister just say to the House what assessment he has made of the risk of a similar hostage incident being taking place in in the region elsewhere? Well, the, I'm very grateful for the, my honourable friend's remarks. The advice that we have received is that um, there is a realistic threat of other such attacks um, uh, in terms of within the, the region um, and against uh, similar types of installations, and we have to guard against that. That is why we've had discussions with the oil companies. That is why uh, we have discussions with governments about what more they can do. Um, I think we have to recognise we face a terrorist threat 
um, right across the region, right across the world, and because of this uh, event, it, it is the case that we should be very, very um, wary and, and, and recognise that further such attacks are possible. Order.